Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from sunny, dark Miami. It's 7 a.m. here uh, over in Belgium. I believe it's uh, uh, 1 o'clock. We have today the pleasure of having Rich Reichert. Uh, he's going to uh, give a presentation today about anti-epileptics in brain tumors. Uh, and we appreciate him coming out. Good morning, Rick. Good morning, John. Thank you for having me on the team. Okay, great. And, and uh, okay, Rick, can you tell a little bit about yourself and what you do? And, and can you tell us a little bit about Uganda and before uh, you, start, you start your presentation? Yes, well, I'm a neurosurgeon and uh, mostly, uh, however, a spine surgeon. So that's m most of my uh, practice, but I still do uh, brain tumor surgery as well. And um, we have indeed a project in Uganda. Uh, in Africa that we started uh, three years ago. Um, called, we call it Spine Care at Cure and we started at the Cure Hospital. That's why it's uh, called at Cure. Uh, but we moved to a university hospital. The idea is to, um, to teach the local neurosurgeon or surgeons there the, the basic spine surgery which is uh, quite lacking and at the same time helping them out with um, cranial surgery as well which might be too difficult for them but is more um, common to to us so it's only one week every year mm -hmm. but uh, we had the pleasure to uh, get in contact with the Duke University that also has a, um, a project running uh, in Uganda in the same hospital and with the Texas Back Institute with uh, Isidro Lieberman. Mm -hmm. So I think when we're combining the three, we can do really a difference um, at Embarara uh, University Hospital. That's in the capital? No, it's not in the capital. Um, we specifically chose not to do that because um, I think we're more in control in Embarara, meaning okay. that if we bring um, uh, instruments, they have the tendency to disappear in Kampala and they don't in Embarara. So for us it's quite important to um, to have a good relation um, with everyone over there and I think Kampala is, is um, so that's Mulago Hospital, is, is just too big and, and there's not enough control over all the equipment and um, that's different in Embarara. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, on to your presentation, Rick, please. All right, let's see if we can get the screen sharing on. So let's try it again. Yep. Is it on? Yes, it, it looks good. Okay, so that uh, the first slide was um, just an introduction. Um, why I also do still do brain tumor surgery. I did a fellowship in Rotterdam, which is the the, the main institute in the Netherlands for brain tumor surgery and later on I went to The Hague uh, where I also did part of my training um, also for oncology and the complex spine surgery. Now I'm in a teaching hospital in, in Antwerp in Belgium only 20 minutes from Brussels uh, where we had uh, the terror attacks on uh, a couple of days ago. And next to this, I also have a teaching job at uh, two uh, university colleges uh, for nurses. And I teach at uh, several courses and workshops. But the presentation today is all about uh, brain tumors and um, anti-epileptic drugs. And I'm showing you the content of what I want to talk about. The first thing is, do we need or is there a place for prophylactic anti-epileptic drugs and then later on we will discuss two of the most important uh, anti-epileptic drugs and their potential in brain tumors. So one of the questions is do we need to give all patients that are diagnosed with a brain tumor some anti-epileptic um, drugs? Well what we do know is that 20 to 40 percent of brain tumor diagno diagnosis, they have already had an, ex an um, at least one seizure at the time of diagnosis, and in that case, there's no doubt we, we just have to give anti-epileptic drugs. But 
there's a big proportion of 60 to 80 percent that does not have had seizures at the moment of diagnosis. And we also know that of that part, only 20 to 45 percent will eventually have a seizure. So the question is, is there a use for um, antiepileptics or not? Well, the Academy of Neurologists, they did a meta-analysis and they found 12 studies where um, they had 26% incidence of seizures before or at diagnosis and only 20% incidence after diagnosis. They also noted a difference in that primary tumors do have more onset of epilepsy than metastasis. And um, about 43% of the patient population received prophylactic drugs, 63% in primary tumors and 32% in metastatic disease. What was very striking is that 40% receiving prophylaxis had sub-therapeutic levels, so they were not even treated as good as they should have been. And in almost one quarter, there were severe side effects. They were severe enough to either change the medication or stop the treatment. Um, some of them had encephalopathy or myelosuppression, ataxia, uh, liver disturbances, etc. So they concluded that there was really no benefit from prophylactic antiepileptic drugs. Um, and there is a a very important interaction with several other medication um, and they also noted that the side effects of giving these antiepileptics were a lot higher in brain tumor patients than in the normal let's say um, epilepsy uh, population. So they uh, pronounced the standard as not uh, to use routinely antiepileptic drugs and a guideline, if you started it, well, stop, stop giving antiepileptic drugs about one week after surgery. So there's quite some consensus uh, about that. And I think in, in the majority of Belgium, we also stick to these um, criteria. That there are a lot of drug interactions we, we do know. Um, I have a list here and one of the most important Antiepileptic drugs for neurosurgeons is uh, valproate or valproic acid, and you also already see that um, they, uh, they there is an increase of serum concentration uh, when you associate it with isoniazide or cimetidine, valdomate or sertraline. The second part of the talk is about um, the drug interactions. And there are two major categories of antiepileptic um, drugs, either the enzyme-inducing and the non-enzyme-inducing antiepileptic drugs. And um, so the enzyme inducers, they enhance the metabolism for um, steroids uh, among them and warfarin, also for antibiotics, antipsychotics and antidepressants. These are all medications that are commonly used with brain uh, tumor or in the brain tumor population uh, for several reasons, but it really is quite common. If we look uh, at this table, these are um, the drugs that have a decreased serum concentration when co-administered with um, one of the enzyme-inducing antiepileptic drugs, and we also see that the steroids are less available, but also the antineoplastic drugs um, that are commonly used in uh, as a chemotherapeutic in brain tumors. So the enzyme inducers are mostly carbamazepine, phenytoin, phenobarbital, and primidone. Um, I think the only one that is still routinely used for brain tumors might be phenytoin. Um, most of the, in most of the cases we use either valproate or levetiracetam, two of the non-enzyme uh, inducers. So this table 
shows us the, the main route of elimination. And what we do see is that the older drugs like carbamazepine, phenobarbital and phenytoin, also the enzyme inducers, they go through the, the liver. The elimination is, uh, is by oxidation and happening in the liver. The more recent um, anti-epileptics, among of them leviteracetam or gabapentin, pregabaline, they have a renal excretion which does not interfere with other medication, uh, very often uh, also eliminated by the, by the liver. We, um, or I uh, found a study by Oberndorfer, uh, who um, did a study and took three or, or divided patients into three groups. Uh, we had an, a group A that had no seizures at all and therefore no antiepileptic drugs. The B group um, was on enzyme inducing antiepileptic drugs, and group C was on non enzyme inducing antiepileptic drugs. And what was striking, although that they still use CCNU as their first line um, chemotherapeutic was that there is a significant difference in survival between groups B and C. So the enzyme inducing did um, worse than the non-enzyme inducing. And there was no difference statistically with group A, neither group A among group B or group A um, and group C. Meaning, or this might lead us to uh, drawing some conclusions that there is a benefit of giving non-enzyme inducing antiepileptic drugs like valproate. Going a bit further on uh, valproate, what we do know also is that it um, increases hematotoxicity, which is probably due to the decreased metabolism of uh, CCNU which leads of course to elevated plasma concentrations and therefore an increased hematotoxicity. What do we know about or what do we know about valproate? Well it's been known um, already at the late 1890s but it was only in 1962 that uh, it came on the market really as an anticonvulsant and later on there were other indications for valproate, like the prevention of migraine. There was also um, a study on mood stabilizing in bipolar disorders, so that's also an indication to give valproate. And one of the things that we also know is that there's a, a, an important teratogenic effect, so um, young ladies that might get pregnant, they should not be on valproate or it should be substituted with something else. But from that knowledge, there was also the idea that there might be a real antineoplastic activity. I don't believe that many neurosurgeons um, know that. So when was I triggered uh, into, into this? Well, that was in 2011 when um, one of my co-workers or former co-workers, Charles Vecht, who, is, uh, who was also taking part of the, the study I'm now showing uh, from the EORTC and from one of their major databases on glioblastoma, they, uh, they noticed that the patient group treated according to the STUP uh, schedule with radiotherapy and temozolomide and receiving valproate, they did significantly better than all other groups. Um, and that's something you can really see on the table. It's the, the darkest green um, curve is valproate with uh, radiotherapy and temozolomide. And if you compare it to the enzyme inducing um, anti-epileptic drugs, the blue curve, there is a major discrepancy. So there are some things about uh, the study we, have, we can say is that there are several shortcomings. It's a, it's a retrospective study. It's underpowered. It was not 
constructed to find um, this um, uh, this result, and it's not completely according to what Oberndorfer found earlier. Although I have to say that the chemotherapeutic is totally different than Oberndorfer used CCNU, and at the EORTC study they used imozolamide, and there's still the problem of hematotoxicity. So. To give some, some figures about this specific study, it was about 573 brain tumor patients and 97 of them were on non-enzyme inducing antiepileptic drugs, usually valproate, and 38 patients they had a combination of two AEDs among an enzyme inducer and valproate. So there was a survival benefit of three months. You could say it's it's not very much three months, but if you take the, the glioblastoma population, which has a, a general survival of about 18 months, then I think the three months benefit is, is really a lot. And it's also the same benefit we see when we added um, timozolomide to the radiotherapy after surgery. The benefit of timozolomide is not more than three months. Um, and if we get the same results from Valproate adding another three months, this might be a very important um, add-on. In another study, but this was uh, more uh, an in vitro study, they found several other tumor modulating aspects of uh, Valproate. It has an effect on the cell cycle, it has an, an effect on apoptosis and differentiation of cells, on tumor metastasis, the immunogenicity, and even on angiogenesis. One of the, um, the aspects of, of Valproate is that it's an HDAC inhibitor. Now, I think neurosurgeons will say, what is HDAC? Well, it's an histone deacetylase inhibitor, which is um, a molecule that makes um, the DNA more compact. So it's HDAC itself makes it more compact by deacetylating um, the DNA. And that's just in contrast to what HAT does, the histone acetyl transferase that makes DNA less compact and easier to transcript. So I have the a schematic here and if you have the closed chromatin or the DNA and if HAT, the histone acetyl transferase, is active you get a more relaxed chromatin which allows for copying the chromatin and on the other hand to return to the closed state you have this HDAC if you inhibit this um, with an inhibitor, like there are two, even already now, two medications on the market, but that's for cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, not for brain, uh, brain tumors, they uh, have the potential to increase cell death of the tumor to um, limit migration and proliferation of the tumor. So these are all the potential uh, influences that HDAC inhibitors can have. Remember that uh, valproate is one such molecule, so it decreases the vascular endothelial growth factor, so angiogenesis is limited, uh, the cell cycle um, is being influenced, the DNA repair mechanisms are also influenced, and several other um, mechanisms helping in um, beating the tumor. I would like now to go to the second molecule uh, or antiepileptic drug, um, leaving Valproate now and going to Levetiracetam, or better known probably as Keppra. Um, it's uh, metabolized through uh, the kidneys, so it does not interfere with many uh, drugs. 
and it has the potential next to the anti-epileptic effect to be an MGMT inhibitor. As we all know, uh, MGMT is a DNA repair protein and it gives a lot of resistance to the alkylating agents such as timozolomide. If we have a lot of MGMT active, it repairs the, the DNA that is being destroyed by uh, timozolomide. So the fact that levetiracetam in itself is an inhibitor of the repair mechanism, it sensitizes tumor cells um, to, to timozolomide. So it increases the effect or the anti-tumor effect of timozolomide. It also has uh, the potential of influencing the HDAC um, molecules. It has a, a couple of other uh, potential influences on uh, tumor biology because it's, uh, it acts as a scavenger for free radicals. It reduces the inflammation and also reduces the neuronal death the one thing we don't want get when giving radiotherapy or chemotherapy. We want to keep our neurons intact but hit the tumor cells. So to conclude, do we need anti-epileptic drugs in brain tumors? Yes, not in prevention but in treatment. And when we choose our anti-epileptic drugs, it will be important in the future to consider really the drug interactions we all know, to um, keep in mind pharmacokinetics and it is important not to choose just one anti-epileptic drug but, but really make the choice based on current, um, current knowledge and there are a lot of, a lot of studies happening um, around the HDAC inhibiting um, potential of anti-epileptic drugs and I think in the near future we will uh, see a lot uh, of things happening and probably treatment of glioblastoma or brain tumors in general might be just a little bit more medical and just a little bit less surgical. And my personal preference at this time would be Keppra uh, because of the least influences on other medication and the potential uh, for influencing in a good way the chemotherapeutics and making tumors more susceptible to the chemotherapeutics. So this is what I wanted to, to present and there will be certainly some questions. Yes, uh, thank you Rick. Uh, we, you can get off the screen share and just click on yes. the green arrow to see your face. Yep. There we go. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, very well very illustrated well talk. Thank you, thank you very much. much. For taking the time. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Anyway, well, you know, well, you're, you're, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just, just a regular doctor, doctor and, and, and as you know, as you know we don't want to any, any new of seizures. Of seizures. You work on, uh, including a uh, uh, CT scan. scan. But, I but I didn't realize, realize there's, there's such a common presenting symptom, a sign, in brain tumors. 20 to 40 percent, that's a pretty high number. Yes, it is. It's um one of the ways to um, to make the diagnosis of a brain tumor is, is at the emergency department uh, after a seizure, for example. So it's it's really common, and every influence on the brain can provoke, of course, an epileptic seizure. Mm -hmm. And um, in that way, it's it's not that strange that that we see a lot of seizures in in the brain tumor patients. And also, the surgery itself can also uh, provoke seizures and that's why we still see between 25 and 40 percent of new onset of epileptic seizures after uh, treatment or during the treatment period. Okay, uh, now you met Rakesh briefly. Rakesh, uh, do you have any questions for Rick? Rick, uh, Rakesh, are you there? Well, I guess, he's, I guess he must be muted. Um, yes. Yeah, you know, is that common, Rick, in, in uh, just brain surgery in general? Uh, do you see a lot of seizures around the operating table because you're operating on the brain? Uh, no, in fact, it's not that common. Uh, we know that it can happen, usually not during the surgery, but after the surgery, uh, because they... Uh, for, for whatever they, reason, right? Uh, 
I had I had it once uh, when I was uh, just uh, even only placing a ventricular catheter for a V patient, and uh, when I just was penetrating the brain to put the catheter in place, uh, a patient had a seizure on the table. So it can happen, but that that is really uh, very rarely. Okay, uh, and you should mention the medication. Uh, Kepra is the brand name. Oh, oh. K of Lipteracetam, yes. How do you, K E P R A? K E double P R A. Okay, yes. Kepra. And, you, and what's the dosage on that? Do you, do you know the dosage on that? Well, it's two times 500 milligrams a day, which is uh, very simple to give. Um, and there's also an, uh, an intravenous uh, alternative. So when we are in the perioperative period and the patients cannot really swallow, for us it's um, it's a good alternative. And that, that's sometimes a problem, like for carbamazepine, what is not used very commonly anymore, you do not have an intravenous alternative. Um, so when Kepra came on the market, that was really um, a good thing that you can have it in tablets, but also intravenously, just like Valproate and finitoine. Well, you know, I, I know it's medicines practiced differently in different countries, but here a, a new onset of seizures usually is admitted to the hospital. Uh, is, is it the same in Belgium? Yes, when it's a first time seizure, patients are uh, admitted at the hospital, then they uh, there are a lot of examinations to, to find a diagnosis, uh, starting with either CT or MRI. And then um, it's, uh, it can be an idiopathic epilepsy, but if there's uh, sometimes we, we find a brain tumor, for example, or, or a bleeding, or uh, an ischemic event, uh, a, C a CVA uh, is also um, possible. Oh, okay. So if, if the patient is diagnosed with a tumor, you usually send them out with Kepra uh, um, until, until well, you decide definitively what you want to do. In Belgium, it's still uh, commonly to use uh, Valproate, and that's okay. because uh, of like legislation. There's no reimbursement in Belgium for Kepra at okay. this moment okay. as a first choice of uh, medication. It might change in the future, but at this point, um, we are more or less obliged to, to start with Valproate, which is, of course, uh, a very good anti-epileptic drug, but it would not be my, my first preference in, in brain tumors and, and for surgery because there's also um, one of the side effects of Valproate is that it increases just slightly the bleeding risk and it might not be um, a very important risk but it's it's there we know it's there well you know um, with intractable seizures if you have a patient with intractable seizures uh, that has a brain tumor uh, does that speed up your whether or not you want to operate? Uh, most probably, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, you, is that an emergency where the patient immediately goes into surgery, or or you just basically try to calm them down for a while? The, before the you, important uh, thing is that if there's not the real emergency to to do the surgery at the real instance, then right. you postpone it until the the next working day. Right. Uh, you have a good team available, okay. not on call team, but your uh, normal um, nurses, instrument nurses, and and just the ordinary team. And and you have to prepare for this surgery. It's not just okay. that you have you it's see the scan and you start uh, surgery. We okay. usually uh, need uh, neuro navigation. Um, and all kinds of other things just to be prepared and that takes a bit of time it does not have to be a long time mm -hmm. um, but it's not that you you like it's not like a bleeding going from the emergency department up to the operating room and uh, start your surgery um, it, it takes some preparation okay uh, well Keish has joined us but he uh, he's having problems with this uh, I'm gonna ask if he wants to write a question he can yeah, write I'm, it in chat. Oh, oh there you go. Your audience work. Go ahead, uh, yeah. yeah, hi. I'm fine. Uh, yeah, nice presentation. Uh, uh, the thing is, I just wanted to ask, uh, you said about a uh, few interactions we should be aware of in anti-epileptic drugs. Which are the most common interactions between which drugs? 
so you come across so we have to avoid it in our clinical practice yes well the important things is the the, the interactions and then usually uh, are with the steroids we are we are giving yeah? so we enhance the metabolism of the steroids so they're less available um, also for antidepressants and antipsychotics what we sometimes give to um, our brain tumor population and um, if patients are on anticoagulants like warfarin there's also an enhanced metabolism of warfarin so that's also uh, quite important and then you um, have also a decreased um, potential of an some antineoplastic drugs so the, the, it, it's quite important the interactions and it doesn't mean that you should not give them the important thing is that, that you have to know about it and, and to make sure that um, the availability either from the anti-epileptic drug or from the other medication is, is high enough um, and sometimes you have to give a bit higher dosage if it's metabolized, metabolized too, uh, too fast. Huh? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, very good, uh, Rick. I thank you for uh, taking the time on a Sunday yeah. in Belgium to give this presentation. I'm sure people appreciated your talk. I didn't realize that that was such a common presenting sign. Uh, I didn't know the statistics. So. Uh, that, that, that for me that was worth it just just to he, to hear that, and we welcome your your participation in the neurosurgical TV in the future, uh, and hopefully we form a network of people like you and Rakesh around, and we'll keep in touch with you. But once the, the Uganda connection gets rolling and gets better, yeah, okay, well, I have good hopes for that. Yeah, I think it's definitely going to happen, Rick. Oh, excuse me, Rick. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of time, and uh, certainly it'll help you c communicate with your Ugandan associates to make sure that your good work down there is yeah. followed up. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much, Rick. And I'll thank send you the link for the talk you. once we edit it. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you too. Bye. Nice meeting you. Yeah, okay. We're, Sorry we're off, to get late. Yeah, we're off the air now, Rick. You, uh, this is Slavin. He's a medical student from uh, Croatia. He, he, works yeah. with, he works with us a lot. Very nice to meet you. Okay, uh, nice to meet you too. Well, you know, you. Uh, you know Slavin, I want to introduce uh, Rick to uh, Fred. You know, Fred, the, the Belgian medical student. Uh, okay. Because those guys, I think they probably work at the same hospital, <laughs> possibly. Do you have a medical school at your hospital, uh, Rick? Uh, well, we are a teaching hospital, so uh, we are not an academic institution, but we are a teaching hospital. Okay, very good. Yeah, Rick gave a good talk on anti-epileptics and tumors, uh, which you'll be able to see, Slavin. So, okay, great. Uh, yeah, and uh, you, you guys went around, but Rick uh, goes down to Uganda uh, a week a year. He and, and associates from the hospital. And they operate. Well, now, what are the kind of things you see down there, Rick? I, I, like I talked, just, you know, just, I'm learning a lot. And a lot yesterday, I learned a lot. And 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 neurosurgeons in developing countries say you see tumors; they're a lot more advanced than oh, you yes. see them here. It's um, it's incredible. Um, when we were there, they prepared a couple of patients for us, but we were not able to um, to operate on all of them. And they had an elderly lady with a, a, a very giant, um, probably um, an olfactory meningioma, but that that was, I think, 10 centimeters in diameter. So that, that it, it's it's incredible how how big tumors can get. Um, we've seen several patients with retinoblastoma, which okay. is very rarely in here in Europe or in the States, um, but quite common in. Um, in uh, Africa, really? and what 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 I found was striking was that we went to an eye clinic uh, over there, and in over the last year, they did surgery on 80, so eight zero retinoblastomas. Wow! And in Belgium alone, we diagnosed probably for uh, in the whole country about eight a year. So wow. it, it it it's an incredible difference, and okay. uh, so. That that's uh, different. What else do we see a lot? Well, you, you see a lot of hydrocephalus in children. 
Right. So it's, it's then not really the brain tumors, but um, a lot of hydrocephalus. That's a, still a major problem. Right. Um, the spina bifida is still um, quite a problem, mm -hmm. um, and there are several um, reasons for that. Mm -hmm. um, and but what I what I do see is that there's quite good care for um, for the hydrocephalus because they um, in Uganda there's a, a small hospital. The, the cure hospital that is treating more than thousand hydrocephalus uh, patients, children every year, mm -hmm. uh, with the help of the Cure Foundation, which is an American foundation um, providing for shunts and also for endoscopy. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of um, uh, uh, third ventriculostomies, so um, which is uh, very important for for Africa. Mm -hmm. um, because you can avoid, in, in a lot of cases, um, silicon drains, which have sometimes a tendency to, to uh, give infections. Well, well you know, I, I had a brief correspondence with an Israeli neurosurgeon that used to go to Niger, uh, okay. which is a country in, in, in Africa, and they have eight neurosurgeons for the whole country. <laughs> I think in Uganda it's about the same. Same? That's that's yeah. Yeah, and I was trying to beseech him uh, um, because he was going down there to teach stereotactic uh, neurosurgery to a surgeon there, uh, and he was, you know, saying that it's tough to, you know, keep on. He can only go down there a certain amount of time every year, and that uh, he would like to continue to train him. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I said, well, this platform, if you can use it you'll be able to keep in contact with that neurosurgeon. And there are actual, there's a, a, a platform, I don't know if, know if Rakesh has heard of it, called iReacts, I-R-E-A-C-T-S. Uh, -E it's a platform like Google Hangout, where, but it lets a super, someone like you in Belgium superimpose their finger on a surgical field mm -hmm. when the surgeon's operating. Uh, so they, there are programs developing where a surgeon can remotely, you know, give input to a surgeon doing stuff in a country like Africa. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think in some ways things will get better. Yeah, I, I'm sure that uh, things will evolve and they, they, they take on the digital world very quickly and, and that's something I see in Uganda as well every year that we go back. There's a um, it, it's it's easier for them to get on the internet, although connections are not always that stable. But, but there there is more interaction. Uh, we are more in contact with them now, and all through smartphones, not with the computer, but usually the smartphones. That's what uh, what's working best out there. Yeah, there's more phones in Africa than than there is access to water yeah. amongst, amongst the population. <laughs> Uh, actually, Uganda is a very green country, so there's no lack of water. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, there are about 80 neurosurgeons in Croatia, and only 4 million people. Uh, Uganda has almost 40 million, as I, as I saw, so that's really strange. 80? And 40 million? 80, 80 uh, on a 4 million, 4 million population. 4 wow. million population neurosurgeons. That's really a big number. Yeah. Uh, in Croatia. That's a lot. Yeah. That's, that's really a lot. And uh, 20 more are, are residents. Oh, okay. Well, we have a really big problem. We have too many residents at the time. And um, we are about 200 neurosurgeons uh, for um, uh, 12 million people. Okay. You know, we have uh, a neurosurgeon on yesterday, uh, Rick. Uh, and I, well, he's coming on today at four o'clock. Matter of fact, uh, he he was the only neurosurgeon for a town in Iraq of eight hundred thousand. Yeah, uh, eight hundred thousand. And you know, you know, Rick and Rakesh, I don't know if you, you're going to hear this. I'm sure, but in Iraq, a common problem for neurosurgeons is bullets that fall from the sky. Like not, not not bullets that you're shot, but bullets that fall from the sky from people that celebrate you know, and shoot the guns in the air and stuff the bullets have to come down somewhere and sometimes they cut down on people's heads 
Love it. That's, uh, that's, you don't uh, have those kind of problems in Belgium. No, 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 no. Normally not. No, not here either. Normally too. <laughs> So yeah, what's the is the country kind of locked down because of the bad things that happened recently, Rick? Um, well, Brussels was uh, totally locked down. In the rest of the country, we didn't really notice uh, a lot. Uh, yeah. Everyone was watching the news, of course, and then see right. what was happening. But um, well, I live at uh, 20 minutes from Brussels airport where the the attack took place, and. Okay. At well, 20 minutes by car, so it, it, it's it's already far enough not not really to be influenced by it. Okay. But um, yeah, it, it made a big impact on the country. Yeah, it's it's the first time that something like this happened in uh, in Belgium. Right. Um, and everyone was already, of course, uh, uh, struck by what happened in Paris in uh, November last year. So, right. Right. Uh, yeah. did, they, did they bring the injured to your hospital? Um, yes, they. Uh, we we had 15 patients. Um, we we received 15 patients from from Brussels Airport. Okay. Yes. So um, we have a lot of hospitals in Belgium. So all patients were distributed among I think 15 hospitals. Um, so everyone got the necessary care. Mm -hmm. And there were no uh, no big problems. Um, everyone um, got into the the hospital they they needed. Right. Uh, um, had a lot of burns. That was right. uh, one of the the things. And um, in the hospital group that that I'm working, we also have a uh, uh, one one specific hospital that takes care of uh, burns. Uh, so they took uh, a bit more um, of those patients. And then the military hospital in Brussels, they uh, have a special um, uh, department for um, burns. So they, well, you, they you know, uh, I, was, I was talking to one of the team members yesterday saying how wartime actually accelerates developments in certain areas of medicine. Uh, yeah, I know the United States uh, has, has increased their research into blast injuries. Mm -hmm. because because of the Iraq War, and because yeah. of the time, digital times, uh, now they're they're outfitting helmets with all kinds of digital devices to be able to measure how much damage a soldier has suffered from a blast remotely. Uh, they can do they're, they're designing helmets like like that. I don't know if you're familiar with that type of research that's being done, but. Um, uh, I had interactions with some researchers that said they're doing a heck of a lot of research. The the, the military and they and they pour all kinds of money, <laughs> all, tons of money. Yeah, they, uh, I had an interview with a guy that have you seen those robotic arm robotic arm arms? Yes. Yeah. This, this we we interviewed a guy from John Hopkins that is being outfitted with a robotic arm, which is amazing. I mean, the the, the dexterity of the fingers and everything else. But that's just part of a larger project of the U.S. military, which is so, this thing, because they're building robots to go into buildings and to do things, you know, that human, they don't want humans to do. And, and, and development of the arm is just a part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, because I I asked him uh, I I said uh, I said do, the, do they let you take the arm home and they said no way he said that you know this is a ten million dollar arm <laughs> yeah uh, the cost is quite high but I think it it, it might make a, a major difference in the in the rehab department it's uh, oh yeah 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 some amazing things I mean he's he's ecstatic he loves to be part of this research. And he, mm -hmm. you know, he goes there a lot and helps them move with it, helps them adjust, adjust the machinery, and uh, you know, is part part of it uh, because they're they're you know developing a complete robot and they're they all all kinds of money to do that. Well, well, Rick, you're welcome to stay. We have another. Let's see, the next one is monitoring and glioma surgery with the Argentinian. Uh, Argentinian neurosurgeon Roberto Herrera. Okay. 